Hi, welcome to the Nonprofit Mastermind Spotlight Series. I'm your host, Brooke Ritchie Babbage. Every Tuesday on the regular Nonprofit Mastermind Podcast, I do a deep dive into the strategies and mindset behind launching and leading a high impact nonprofit. This spotlight is a special weekly series in which I showcase and celebrate the organizations inside my Impact Accelerator program. I lift up their mission, their work, and their incredible personal stories of leadership. This week, I am spotlighting Global Health Council. It's a national organization that sits in a really unique intersection within the global health world. They don't just bring together stakeholders around and across specific health issues. They address cross-cutting issues that really go to the core of strengthening and supporting all of the many individual issues in the space. They make sure that the infrastructure, policy, and resources are there to drive consensus and to ensure security across the entire global health space as a whole. As Elisha and I discuss, it's a massive and complex undertaking, and the organization has been really good at it for decades. Elisha and I talk about the intricacies of operationalizing a complex theory of change, the importance of engaging in system level work, and how to think about and define meaningful impact in the advocacy space. And we talk about the true meaning of health equity and where Global Health Council is going in the coming years, how absolutely critical Elisha and the Global Health Council members recognize it is for people from every part of the globe to be at the same decision-making table and to shape policy together. It's a great conversation and I hope you enjoy. Hi, Elisha, how are you? Good, Brooke, how are you? Good. It's really great to have you here and to talk about your work, especially now in sort of the larger <laughs> landscape of what's happening around health in our in our world. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for doing this. I love that you're doing these little spotlights and have really enjoyed being part of the Nonprofit Accelerator so far. So I'm excited to share a little bit more about Global Health Council. Wonderful. That makes me happy. So so let's dive in. Um, let's start big picture. Mm-hmm. What is Global Health Council and what are you guys doing in the world? It's such an amazing organization. I don't know if you can even capture all that you do in this you know, 20 minute conversation. <laughs> the elevator pitch. So Global Health Council is the leading member organization devoted to advancing global health priorities. We unite advocates, implementers, policymakers, and other stakeholders. And we're really driven by this idea of the collective voice and using the power of our community's collective voice to drive sustainable and equitable funding and policies that hopefully improve health and well being for, for all. We have about um, 100 plus, slightly over 100 organizations who are members. Um, that includes international nonprofit organizations, some private sector members, some academic members, some foundations, and we really collectively work to achieve this goal. And many of our member organizations work not just in the United States, but overseas. And I think there's about coverage of like 150 countries all told collectively. So it's a really a broad range geographically and also a broad range of health issues that we work across. So why collective? I mean, I know there are so many organizations that do health work, both nationally and globally. But I think one thing that's been really intriguing to me about your model and sort of even your mission is that this collective voice, this working together, um, as a unified set of stakeholders, even though there are multitudes within that group, is is an important part of your mission. Could you talk more about why that's so important? Sure. I mean, it actually goes back to kind of how the organization was started um, 50 years ago. It was a group of um, same kind of people, um, public health professionals, academics, advocates, who were really concerned that there was not um, a a cohesive group of voices advocating for kind of the burgeoning U.S. foreign assistance 
policy and funding that was happening. So, you know, the United States Agency for International Development was started soon, before, you know, just a little earlier. Peace Corps had started all of these things that really began um, in the 60s and 70s. And this group that came together really wanted to have some consensus and some um, magnification among among a larger than one because if anyone who's advocated knows advocacy is a contributive effort um, and takes many people working on the same issue to really make progress and a change. So that we've really stuck true to that kind of initial idea of collectivity and contribution. And yes, there are a multitude of um, voices and differences of opinion, and you know, like any coalition. It's the job of the coalition <laughs> facilitator to yes. help bring people to the same point. So yeah. that's a lot of our work is really trying to get that consensus building. And we always follow the science and we follow public health. So that's a good starting point, right? I mean, everyone that joins Global Health Council knows we're going to do evidence-based advocacy. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have that ground, but you'd be surprised how many different ways you can go even with that basis. I was going to say, I mean, <laughs> There's lots of ways to cut that pie. <laughs> right. So how do you find your way to a common, maybe not end goal, but do, how do you craft a common voice, right, in response to issues, you know, like the one we're facing now here in, in the U.S.? Mm-hmm. I mean, even if you say evidence-based, rooted in science, and assume there's values alignment, right? Mm-hmm. Even with those assumptions, I would imagine that it is difficult as an organization to bring all of these people to a single point of agreement. Do, do you do that? Does that work? Some it works sometimes better than others. <laughs> yeah. I think that, and I would say, I mean, we we are the kind of secretariat of this membership organization. We have amazing members who are all passionate and invested in the work that they do around global health and who are technical experts in different areas of global health. So the team at Global Health Council that really manages everything doesn't, we don't pretend to be the technical experts on food and nutrition or maternal child health. We're really looking at cross-cutting issues that affect everything and also looking at ways to get the resources and progressive policies that help make those things possible. So we have a few areas where we really focus, um, and that is kind of what we call our pillars. But I think, you know, we have so many global health areas that, that fall under us that we really focus more on the system and the structure. So we do a lot of work driving consensus towards um, well-resourced and effective U.S. global health policy from the federal level, um, and then also making sure that multilateral organizations working in the space are also well-resourced and effective. So those are groups like United Nations agencies, the World Health Organization, the Global Fund for AIDS, TB, and Malaria, those kinds of things. And then we have kind of two other cross-cutting pillars that maybe fall under a slightly more programmatic focus and one is global health equity um, and really making sure that we have the broadest, most inclusive group of stakeholders at the decision-making table and that these policies are really, you know, doing that that equity picture of like removing the barriers at different levels for what's needed. Um, And then very timely, we've always worked on this, but it's become more intense in the past couple of years is around global health security. And that's really where our work on COVID and pandemic preparedness and response falls. Um, And so you can imagine that the balance of those right now, depending on what's happening, it shifts quite a bit, but um, certainly the pandemic issues have been pretty up there for the past couple of years and probably will continue to be, unfortunately. I mean, what's interesting to me Um, in terms of what I'm hearing about even sort of like a theory of change to be wonky about Mm -hmm. it for a second is that your organization doesn't just sort of bring together stakeholders around specific health issues, right? Like reproductive Mm -hmm. justice or water or, you know, child health and nutrition, which are really, really critical. Yeah. But you mentioned these cross-cutting sort of... um, these cross-cutting issues that really go to the core of strengthening and supporting 
all of those individual issues. So making sure that infrastructure is there, making sure that policy is there, making sure that resources are there, irrespective of the individual sort of you know right. security equity. That seems really unique. Are there other organizations that really approach health in that way? I, I mean, I think there are other organizations that approach international development in that way or kind of systems level. Yeah. As far as I know, in the U.S., we are the global health focused organization that does that. Um, we have other peer organizations organizations who are also membership and network that work on other aspects of like humanitarian assistance or um, kind of big budget numbers overall, really, you know, trying to engage with with Congress and making sure that foreign assistance itself is well funded. And that includes the health component. Um, Yeah, I mean, it can be difficult, I think, to to and you said this at the beginning, like all the work that we do, how do you explain that? We are quite focused, I think, on the global health architecture, if that's maybe the moniker that we call it, or creating the enabling environment for, you know, equitable global health policies and programs. We we tend to kind of group, I don't, it's not really a theory of change, but kind of the three ways that we work, we would say are advocacy, access, and amplification. Um, and so I think the advocacy part we've talked about, the access part is also um, leveraging our relationships to give our members access to, you know, policymakers and other key stakeholders and really helping so to bridge the, yeah. bridge the gap there. And amplification, we always want to showcase our members' work. Mm-hmm. Um, and so really uplifting that and making sure that we we're able to get their their voices on platforms and just share all of the stuff because there's so much happening and I think it can really be tricky. I mean, we talked about this earlier today in a different session, but to amplify what you're doing and really make it get out there beyond your kind of common network. Yeah. Um, so, so that that's how we move, I think. Um, and then we do have in this collective voice concept, right? Part of that is really making space for discussion and debate and and building consensus. And and so while we tend to focus as the kind of secretariat at the systems level, we do have a number of what we call roundtables where people can come together and talk on issue specific. So we have a global health security one. We have a maternal newborn child health one. Um, we work with another group on water, sanitation, and health. So, so there is still that space because you need kind of an objective communal space, right, where people can come and talk without bringing everything from their organization as the kind of, I don't want to say baggage, but it is. I mean, every organization has its priorities. Um, and so Global Health Council can sort of be that objective arbiter and, and make space for people to come and compromise and discuss things. And, and that is how supposedly you get to the consensus at the end. It doesn't always work out. Those spa- but you need the spaces. You space, need right. to do the work. Yeah. I mean, one thing that, um, and this also came up in, in an earlier session with us mm-hmm. today, is this idea of impact, right? And I think, yeah. um, you know, a lot of organizations um, and a lot of people, when they think nonprofit impact, they think how many kids got food, right? Or how right. many parks did you build? Really important sort of outputs. Um, and those are important in measuring the mm-hmm. change that we're bringing about in the world. What I find really interesting about your work, um, and and I'm really drawn to it because I've always sort of had a, a thing. I, I like policy <laughs> level work. Yeah. Is it strikes me that it could be trickier to define your impact, right? To help people mm-hmm. see, you know, we're not going to check off 10 kids that we reached or baby seals that we saved. So how do you talk about your impact to people who are really drawn to your mission? Yeah, it is. It is hard. I know, you know, they say like time is a cruel mistress, but I would say advocacy is a cruel mistress because <laughs> you can do everything right from an, from an advocate's perspective of all the things you're supposed to do and the relationships, and, the- right? Relationships, the talking points, the, yeah. you know, meetings and, um, and then you get to the 11th hour and it's like, oh, sorry, we can't do that for you today. And you're like, wait, we just put in 45 years of work to get to this moment <laughs> in three weeks. 
Um, so I think that that that's challenging. I think, you know, there's a whole kind of sector of monitoring and evaluation that is about monitoring and evaluation impact for advocacy. And I think what we've learned from that is <clears throat> to have some milestones along the way. So, yes. you know, one of the things I think in our work we try to measure is um, on the policymaker side, the kind of champion building. Like, are we seeing an increase of statements or engagement or, um, you know, if it's votes, that's great, but sometimes you can't even get to the votes, but anything that shows kind of a progression along the spectrum of a policymaker or other stakeholder being more invested in these, these goals of like well-resourced multilaterals or, you know, effective U.S. assistance. Um, and so that that's one thing. I think we also... And this, this is where it gets, I feel, a little unsatisfying that we go to the output rather than the outcome stage. But Hard not to. Around, sort of yeah, I mean, you, yeah. That, right. Particularly around like the number of engagements we have with mm-hmm. federal officials or um, multilateral officials or, you know, are, are, we get, are we getting quoted in media? Are we seeing our own thought leadership reflected in um statements and for our members are members satisfied with the access they're getting are are they getting amplified has our work in amplifying them led to and leverage their their own networks to be something greater Um, and we do we have a, a couple of um publications that we put out regularly and so one of those is a the global health briefing book which we do every time there's a new congress and so that's really an opportunity again to like align the messaging and um we we have you know sort of a page on every kind of global health subject area that gets funded by the u.s government and it's an opportunity for our our members to to put in their own talking points and contribute to this kind of collective voice. Um, But then we also use that throughout the year to do our advocacy and make sure that things are moving. And so that's just another measure of impact, right? Like how does that get used? What does it look like? Is it used by policymakers? Is it used by our members? So there are those those kinds of things. Um, And we also have a, a yearly meeting we call the global health landscape symposium where we really highlight kind of a a trending issue or something that's happening so this past year we did something around global health security and how we really move that kind of national security narrative to more uh, on one of solidarity um and you know this year we're going to have midterms and there'll be a lot of you know moving into election season so so really looking at that and what the impact of that event is and sort of how the thread carries throughout the year. But just to say, it's not it's not easy with advocacy. I mean, I think the service delivery is a much cleaner yeah. oh, impact yeah. to capture. Uh, and so you kind of have to get creative with the, with the advocacy measurements. I mean, I hear a few things that I, I just want to lift up because I think they're really powerful. Um, both about how you guys have impact and about how you're sort of describing the kind of impact. So one is um, the curation of information, right? So you have this briefing book, you said these other publications, um, and even just how you're talking about um, the cross-cutting issues. There's a, hey guys, you guys are on the ground doing this work. One of our additive roles can be to be above the trees, Mm -hmm. right? And pull together what we're hearing and doing some sense-making for you, right? Right, so right. and sense-making is a form of impact, right? It is a form of providing information, you know, as you know, yeah. in population, you have like, that That changes hearts and minds when people have good, real, not fake data. Yeah, absolutely, you know? absolutely. That's true. I think, I think we know it changes hearts and minds. I think measuring the change yes. is where right. for us it gets tricky, but we do it because we know it works. You know it's, it's working, like, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so I, I mean, that's absolutely true. And I, I think that, that um, that's part of the access piece to really like access to information and access directly, right? So yes. really talking to the policymaker, um, the the, right. right, who's in charge and can answer questions and really have a dialogue about that. Um, I think that's a really important role for us. I think so. Yeah. And then the other two that I heard are, 
Um, and I just, you know, my mind always goes to there's sort of other organizations that are, you know, not 50 years old that, that <laughs> are, are, are still trying to figure out, right? Like we want to be in the advocacy space. We want mm-hmm. to have systems level change and impact. And that's partly why I'm loving sort of really picking your brain about being good at having impact because you guys have been good at having impact for generations. Mm-hmm. Um, and so just sort of lifting up, like there, there is a method to the madness, right? So there's the curation, there's the convening, bringing people together and the creating space for real discussion across difference, right? Not just an echo chamber, but how do we, yeah, we all want the same thing, but how do we navigate the multitudes and, and have yeah. real conversation and engage in collective problem solving? Um, yeah. Yeah, and it's, um, I think what we all, uh, for those of us who either, and I know you did too, went to law school or went into policy change, you have this kind of idea that, you know, you're going to out of the bat have a kind of Supreme Court level oh, yeah. shift in in your work and in the yes. sector that you work in. And it is yeah. not that. It is like a Sisyphean pushing the rock up the hill and a chipping away at these like very small and not, I mean, I think that there's that piece that you're saying of like the systems change and, and the big idea and you every, we should all have that, right? Like the campaign and the vision, but that policy change, it is like the detail of one word versus the other. There's, there's nothing sexy or appealing or, you know, yeah. about it. It doesn't make donors swoon. That's you, right. know, you can't like at the end, you're like, and then we change the word and to, or, and that's that right. leads to $500,000. Yes. It's, not, it's not a great story, yeah. but that's actually in the details is where it all happens. And so I think for those that want to go into it and everybody is an advocate, I always say, you know, if you're trying to convince someone that you want to go to dinner at a different place, you are advocating on your own behalf. So That's right. <laughs> taking that up a notch, like just know it's not a, um, there's no aha moment, <laughs> like at the end of a movie where the sun comes out, it's yeah. just one kind of chip to the next chip, to the next chip, to the next chip. And then something happens. It's different. There are two, um, two sort of quotes that I I really like that I think capture just this, um, how we have to keep showing up, right? To do Mm -hmm, the work which you and I were talking about before we we started the the conversation. But um, one is, I don't know if you've seen the movie Parenthood. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, So love that movie. I've now watched it since becoming a parent. (laughs) Very different. (laughs) Um, But there's the scene with Steve Martin and his dad where he's like, here's the thing about parenthood. And I would venture to say, advocacy work, being a nonprofit leader, adulthood. (laughs) There's never a moment where you've crossed into the end zone and you get to pitch the football. Like that just doesn't happen. And I think, you know, as a young lawyer, as Mm a, as an ED, Mm -hmm. um, you think, you think that's what you're shooting for, right? You're aiming for this. And then when years go by and you're like, but when's my pitch the football and dance moment? You can feel like you're doing it wrong, but you're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. No, you're right. It's it's never you never sort of get there. It's it is like adulthood because I think that's the that's the lesson. I'm currently seeing my 18 year old daughter, about to be 18, learn herself. She's like, "What do you mean? There's another test and another form I have to fill out. I'm 18." And I was like, "Yeah." (laughs) what you will be saying every day for the rest of your life the rest of your life <laughs> yes and and so that brings up the second quote which i love and often sort of refer to in my newsletter which is you know the moral arc of history is long mm, yeah right? and i think um you know i have been such an admirer of your work since you joined the accelerator and i think Part of it is my natural affinity for, for policy and right. system change, but also because, you know, you're in you're fighting the long fight, right? And you look back over 50 years or just your own tenure, which I want to talk mm-hmm. about in a moment, sure. and you do have to remind yourself that that we're trying to bend this arc and we may not see right. the way in which we've bent the arc on any given day, but we can look back and say, yeah, yeah, we're going in the right direction, right. you know? Right. 
Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, it's funny that you said that because that's actually, I mean, I started out not to totally shift the conversation. Yeah, no, I was going to say, how do you, how do you stay in this? Yeah. I mean, so I started out, um, as a, an epidemiologist that I, you know, went to grad school and I was really, I was really interested in health, um, and particularly women's health and had thought about going to medical school. And I was like, I don't think I can do that. <laughs> I I can do it. Do that much school. So a family friend who was an epidemiologist is an epidemiologist was like, well, try this because it's a master's degree. And then you can kind of figure out what you want to do. And, um, so I did that focused on women's health. And then I went into the Peace Corps doing women's health and then kind of came back and was working doing public health intervention stuff, you know, a little research, a little bit of public health programming, and particularly in the public health programming piece, but also the research because it was about environmental justice and health, really saw that it was with either a policy shift or a funding shift at the state level. This was, I was living in New York State at the time, is where you kind of saw that big change, right? I mean, that's right. Not as, not Supreme Court level big change, but like yeah, people's bigger, lives. Bigger. Right, macro level. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, well, that's what I want to do. So then went to law school with the idea that I would be working on health policy stuff. And um, really that kind of took off for me working, you know, the combination of experience and education and living in DC where, you know, you can't throw a stone. Everything is, you yeah. A lawyer. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> and and so then worked for a long time at different nonprofits, and I've always really been a nonprofit person. Um, yeah, I think too. it's been almost my entire career. Yeah. And came to this organization about seven months ago after having been um, an interim co CEO at a different organization where I was for about thirteen years. So it's you know it's it's new and not new. Um, it's yeah. definitely a broader range of issues than I have worked on previously. Um, but you know, advocacy and coalition work, just like everything else, it has a methodology behind it. So it's a transferable skill. I think it's just been absorbing the technical stuff that's been kind of paramount for me. How did the, the EDing of it all. <laughs> EDing of it all. Exactly. Exactly. So and I, I think this is a great question for you because you are still um you're both very steeped in the work and mission of the organization and newish, right? In mm-hmm. in your role as the ED. What do you think is most surprising about the work that you do? What might people who know your mission and your work mm-hmm. be most surprised by? Um, um I that's a great question. <laughs> I think um I I think that people know the staff. I think maybe they don't know everything the organization does, right? I think they would be surprised by seeing beyond like the newsletter. Like if you're not as engaged or if you aren't a member, right? I mean, we have a lot of things that we do for members. So this access piece and these curated conversations and even curated information, I mean, a lot of that is for members because we really want people to come into this fold, into this um, kind of global health community. I think... And I don't know if people would be surprised about this, but I I think for me, this is a real like passion point and something that we need to do as an organization is to really diversify our membership. I mean, the the organization started out really focused on U.S. policy and so is predominantly U.S. based organizations. Um, but we work on global health. So that's not acceptable to me, right? We we can't be talking about global health. And I mean, the U.S. is a part of the globe, which the U.S. forgets. <laughs> but we can't be talking about what's happening in other countries or what the needs are in other countries without giving, having people from those countries at the same table with the same decision-making power and the same kind of co-designing of policies and programs moving forward. So we haven't gotten there. We've been having a lot of conversations about it. You know, Brooke, that I'm working on the strategic plan with my staff and with the board, um, building on what's been there before. But I really, I want us to get there because I, I, I mean, I got into this, yes, the medical school thing, but also really from a health equity lens. I mean, that's why I got involved with health. And so this has to be a health equity based coalition yeah, and community. Right. 
And I, I mean, it's there. I, you know, I hear it when, when our members are talking and I hear the desire and we just have to figure out a way to, to make it, make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, Op operationalize and codify. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. So what's coming up in the next year that you're most excited about folks knowing? Well, so I, I mentioned this to you earlier. So next week is the World Health Assembly, um, which is the annual meeting of the World Health Organization in Geneva. And so there's a lot of policy decisions that will be made about, again, the global health architecture and investment in different disease areas and really hopefully getting us out of this pandemic once and for all. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of important things that happen happen there um, and we'll be there. We're doing some events. We'll be, you know, making statements on behalf of our constituency. Um, and it's really important that civil society is included in these spaces. That doesn't always happen. And this year, unfortunately, we have less inclusion than we've had in the past because of the pandemic. Because of the is it because of the pandemic? yeah, yeah. Um, so we're going to make the best of it, but we have to make sure that that doesn't keep happening. Um, and then, I mean, we're still trying to get COVID supplemental money from the United States. <laughs> so, I keep getting, I keep talking trust. about nonprofits here, getting these emails that are like, sorry, it's going to be another six months. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I know there's a lot of, you know, t fires happening in tandem. I mean, certainly the war in Ukraine is a real crisis and will have um, implications beyond just the European borders because of food and nutrition issues. Um, but we have to be able to hold more than one crisis at a time, right? There's multiple things. Ethiopia is also in a crisis. They're desperately in need of food and, and everyone is in need of peace. So that's actually what I hope happens, <laughs> that we just have peace across the board <laughs> in the next I year. That. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's a lot of, I mean, the thing about health is it's integral to everything. So um, nothing you know, matters. Never, either there's happen. never a shortage of things yeah. to, to work on. Yeah, yeah, there's never a shortage of need. So how can folks get involved and learn more? So there's a couple of different ways. We do have, a um, if you are an organization that's listening and you're interested in joining, you can go to our website, globalhealth.org, and um, learn how to become a member. We have a sliding scale of membership dues, so we try to make it as equitable as possible. Um, we also have publications and newsletters that go out, so you can sign up for those. We have advocacy updates, um, so if you want to keep abreast of what's happening in D.C. and beyond on the, the global health front. And we always welcome donations. I wouldn't be an ED if I didn't <laughs> say, if you believe in what we're doing, <laughs> I'm so free proud. to donate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, we don't we don't have sort of an individual advocacy call to action. But if you sign up for our materials, then those things will come up as as we're going along, and there may be different opportunities to um, participate in in those kinds of call to actions on the federal level. Which is wonderful. It's a way in for people who right. really care, but actually have you know day jobs <laughs> that aren't yes, about exactly <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for having this conversation with me. I always thank love you. learning in more depth, even more than I than I knew about your incredible work um, and your wonderful stewardship of just, you know, literally a worldwide coalition. Um, so it's been great hearing more about what you do. And, and I thank you. Thank you, Brooke. Thanks so much for having us and for helping us all be better and stronger nonprofits. <laughs> Appreciate that. Have a wonderful We all need support and community, so it's terrific. Yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. Have a great day. Thanks, Brooke. You too. Thank you so much for joining me for this week's episode of the Nonprofit Mastermind Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on Apple or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you think what we talk about here, the trainings and the guests and the conversations could benefit another leader in your life, I'd love if you would leave a review and share with your friends. If you want to take the next step and begin to put into practice what we talk about on this podcast, I've created a toolkit where I collect and share downloads from many of our conversations. It's got templates, worksheets, and references to help you execute on what we talk about here on The Mastermind. There's lots of great stuff, and I add to it almost every week. You can download it at richiebabbage.com 
backslash architecture of impact toolkit. I also want to share another free resource for leaders of growing nonprofits. It's a free training. It's called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. The four questions you need to ask to know if your nonprofit is really ready to scale. Growing an organization doesn't happen by accident, as we all know. You have to take the right strategic steps at the right time to avoid overwhelm and burnout and that horrible feeling that so many of, of us have had as you watch the work of your organization outstrip capacity and sometimes even funding. It's almost impossible to reverse engineer good growth. And by that, I mean growth that can be sustained over time just by looking at what you think you see in other organizations. So in this free training, I help cut through all the noise and I identify the four simple questions that if you really engage with them and think about them, will tell you when you're ready to grow without frenzy, without overwhelm, and with the confidence that you're making the right moves for your organization. You can access the training at richiebabbage.com backslash ready to scale. Finally, if you'd like more leadership resources and strategies in your life, sign up for my weekly newsletter, Leadership Forward 321. Each week, I curate and share three articles, two resources, and a quote on a theme. You can get that at richiebabbage.com backslash leadership forward 321. That's all for now. Have a great week, and I'll see you back here next week for more Mastermind.